Thanks very much, Barbara, for that lovely introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight. Uh, those are now some of my favorite lines in any book review anywhere, that long for this world is a great trip. I so much wanted it to be a great ride for the reader, and uh, not a forbidding one or a dense one or horror of horrors, one that put your nose in mortality page after page as you were ostensibly reading about immortality. If you're approaching this subject with a certain degree of skepticism, which I'm sure we all are, then even talking about immortality does throw you back toward issues that uh, lie very deep in us, uh, uh, issues of mortality. The, uh, uh, the book that Barbara mentioned that brought me here the first time I was here, uh, The Beak of the Finch, is about a very out-of-the-way subject. It's about uh, finches in the Galapagos Islands. And I've kind of made a career of writing books that are somewhat out of the way. I followed that one with a book about um, the genes and instincts of fruit flies in laboratories, uh, Time, Love, Memory. So I thought with this book I would write about something so close to home that it is just about inescapable, I think uh, close to home for all of us, which is this question of mortality. Uh, why are we mortal? Why did uh, we evolved to be mortal. Could we have evolved to be immortal? Is there something that human beings in our nearly infinite ingenuity can do to make us uh, immortal or a little closer to immortal? And this again is a subject that I think one way or another haunts us. Uh, haunts almost all of us from very, very young, either as a subject that we think about or a subject we deliberately push away and don't think about. And I find this coming up constantly now in wonderful bookstores like this, because whenever I pick up a book, I stumble upon someone else who is obsessing about this very question, naturally, because we're all obsessing about this question. So the other day on um, uh, uh, before another reading, I picked up a new novel by the uh, hipster novelist Gary Steingart, Super Sad True Love Story. I don't know if any of you uh, have picked that up. The first line is, Dearest Diary, today I've made a major decision. I am never going to die. And I also picked up John Updike's uh, last collection of poems, Endpoint, which includes the beautiful line, ironic and beautiful, God save us from ever ending, though billions have. And then of course there's Woody Allen. Everyone in the science of aging quotes Woody Allen on the subject. He said, uh, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. <laughs> and he also said, I think equally, equally astutely, as long as they are mortals, Human beings won't be totally relaxed. So this is the theme of the written word from the very beginning. Um, you go back to an Egyptian papyrus scroll more than 3,000 years old, the oldest known medical text, and you find starting at the top um, the, uh, a great doctor, Egyptian doctor named Imhotep was talking about cases that he had seen and making recommendations, what you should do if you see a case like this, uh, starting at the top of the head and working down. And to the frustration of historians, the scribe who copied that precious scroll got impatient somewhere around the chest left the rest blank, flipped over the papyrus, and on the back scribbled a, a prescription for anti-wrinkle cream. And <laughs> it's an incredibly elaborate prescription. It obviously was an ointment that would have cost a fortune. And it ends found effective myriads of times. So right then, right from the very beginning, almost as soon as words are being written down, people are worrying about this question. Why are we mortal? Do we have to be mortal? What can we do to stop aging? At about the same time that that scribe wrote the papyrus scroll in Egypt, in Sumeria, uh, just across the Mediterranean, 
people were writing in cuneiform the story of Gilgamesh, who was a great king of Sumeria and decided that all his palaces and power were worthless because he was mortal and his friends were mortal. And he goes off into the desert looking for a cure for aging, and he almost gets it twice. Once, if only he had been able to keep his eyes open for a solid week, a wise man at an oasis would have told him the secret of immortality. And he kept his eyes open until the last second of the last day, and so he couldn't get the secret. And then the, the, the guru of immortality told him, I'll give you one more chance. Swim down, go to this uh, other oasis and swim down into the bottom of this pool and you'll find a weed down there. He describes the weed, pluck the weed, bring it back up. If you make it to shore, you and your friends will be immortal. And Gilgamesh does it, he finds the weed, he swims back, and at the last second, a snake, a water snake, leaps out, grabs the weed from his hand. And so again, he's just, he had it in his hands and he lost it. Which is a familiar story, of course, the snake got in the way in other stories we remember from about the same time and place. So always this sense that there must be a cure, there must be an answer, and if one could find it, it would be the greatest achievement of human knowledge of natural philosophy um, centuries later, of alchemy, then of what we now refer to as the scientific revolution. The founders of the scientific revolution were almost to a man, and they were men, obsessed with this problem. Can we cure aging? Sir Francis Bacon wrote A History of Life and Death in which he laid out research projects that people are still pursuing now. And uh, Pascal was obsessed with this. Descartes was obsessed. On and on, Benjamin Franklin wrote beautifully about the possibilities of immortality and argued that we would surely get there. He was very optimistic about the future of the United States of America and very optimistic about modern science. And he saw all of it entwining and arriving right about now at um, a blissful state of immortality. That was his hope. So I got interested in this subject back in 1984. I was a very young science writer, and I had wangled an interview with a very old biologist named Maria Rudzinska, who worked at Rockefeller University and who was convinced that she might be able to figure out what causes aging. And she was studying single cells through the microscope, trying to figure it out. She herself was in her 80s, and it was clear that aging was winning the race over science in her case. So it was poignant, and it was touching to me to interview Maria Rudzinska. And I fell in love with the subject as a kind of doomed quest. But right around that time, 1984, scientists, more and more scientists, began to get interested in this problem and to make progress. And the field, to my own surprise, began to get hot. So that very quickly, well not very quickly, but within 10 years or so, by the mid-90s, sorry, I had terrible visions just then of knocking off the, knocking over the cup of life and it would spill. Uh, the, um, uh, the scientists were arriving in this field in larger and larger numbers. And Maria Rudzinska was now gone, but the field was that she had labored in in a, in a very lonely way was now becoming populated with optimists. Uh, so I started following it, and I started looking for someone to center the book upon. And in... Um, what was it, the winter of 2002, I finally met a character I felt would be a good character to carry this book. And that, as Barbara said, is uh, this British gerontologist, Aubrey de Grey. And Aubrey is a character. Aubrey is happy to present himself as a character. He looks like Methuselah before his beard turned gray. He's six feet tall. He's medievally pale and thin. He uh, has uh, uh, a beard that's not 
not only impressive, it's almost supernaturally impressive. It hangs almost down to his waist. And um, he also has a prodigious appetite for beer, which he drinks pretty much from morning till night. 